it says I'm alive, which confirms that I'm alive. But if I had existential OCD, I'd be curious if that would still be the case. But hey, something we could talk about along with any other tips or things about OCD as well too. Welcome, welcome, welcome once again, everyone, to your Wednesday night webinar here with No CD. No CD, a downloadable app that you can get on Google Play or iOS. You may also go to treatmyocd.com or nocd.com to get some info about us. Feel free, please, to do so. And use the No CD community to kind of check out what's going on in the world of OCD and, uh, you know, just being real about the OCD world. Ben says, shout out to Dr. McGrath for going the extra mile and reaching out this week. Well, well, thanks, Ben. Uh, I, I appreciate that. Uh, and OCD Crusher says, good news. I've been feeling great since Sunday. That's awesome. Although, be ready for your OCD. Say, wait, what? Hold on. Hold on. Well, let's change that. <laughs> so, because OCD likes to, you know, take a poop on your parade route whenever possible. Uh, and I was in marching band. You know, there's always like a horse in front of us or some just dropping turds all over the road. So you'd always have to dodge those things, which, which really, uh, you know, really wasn't the most fun thing in the world. But hey, it, it is whatever it was. Tori says, loving Wednesdays with Dr. McGrath. Well, Tori, loving Wednesdays with you too. Or toy, I'm sorry, toy, toy. My uh, T-O-I. Yeah. Can't read these days. Yeah. I tell you what, I'm getting old, uh, people. I, I had to go check these out. Let's, let's get Let's get the opinion of the world. Had to go get me some computer glasses because uh, I'm I'm sitting on this thing all day long. That that the eyes are just like, you know, that's uh, what happens when you when you get old. <laughs> so anyway, um, I've been on most of the day though, so we're doing we're doing pretty good. There we go. All right. Well, Danielle's here. Ellie, hey, awesome. Caroline, good to see you. Witty Vixen, yeah, I like that. How are you? Good, good to see you. Good, Ben, Tracy, and we got you know, lots of folk here today already. All right, Reed, Danielle. Oh, oh, the glasses uh, seem to seem to get the uh, A plus uh, rating there. So, so that's good. Thank you, thank you, everyone. Sup, Daniel? Good to see you. Yeah, sup, sup. Um, Reed, great last name there, Reed. By the way, I really like that. That's awesome. Um, all right, marmalade. I uh, don't know if it's orange or raspberry, but we'll we'll soon find out. Somatic OCD tends to refer to physical bodily sensations such as breathing. Can they apply to thoughts as well? Uh, well, you know, OCD is intrusive thoughts, images, or urges. So it could be thoughts about your body that you find to be intrusive and then that you have to sit with and you know, probably not go online and do a bunch of research about and everything as well, too. So, yeah, I see no reason why that that would not be the case whatsoever for somebody. So sure, we'll go with that. Absolutely, totally fine. Makes a lot of sense. I'll take it. All right, Tori says I'm awesome. Well, Tori, you're awesome too. Tori, by the way, is our uh, in the background person. Background Kaylee is off for the week. Background Tori is uh, taking place tonight. So if Tori gets any questions on that Instagram uh, thingamajigo, she's gonna pop them on over to me on the old slackaroonie and uh, we'll we'll go that way. So, um, question comes in. Do I know whether 5-HTP can relieve OCD symptoms to help cope with it? Thank you. I, I do not, Evie. I apologize. I don't know much about 5-HTP, so uh, I, I fear you'll have to do a little research on that in another point in time, or uh, I'd be happy to reach out to our medical director, see if he has some, and let me see if I can find out something uh, for next week on that. And then there's Carl, Carl's, oh, Carl, Carl, oh, God, Carl. Anyway, uh, hi, Morgan. Is there anyone in the OCD community that fights for better benefits for those who are on disability because of OCD? That is a great question, Morgan. And, you know, something that OCD is kind of interested in and why we're always pushing to get uh, coverage for OCD through the NoCD app as well, too. But I think that there's many things that you can do, Morgan. There may be things through the International OCD Foundation. You may also see if your local representative does any lobbying work at all, and that might be helpful. 
uh, you may also write to those Congress people and say, hey, you know, this is something that I support and please look into this for the benefit of your members. And there's also, uh, well, they didn't do it last year with COVID, but the International OCD Foundation's also done a march on Washington, D.C. <laughs> Who knows what's going to happen? This There's lots of fences around Washington, D.C., so there might not be many marches going on this year. But uh, the International OCD Foundation, I know, has been pushing for benefits and things like that as well, too. So I hope that that helps you a little bit. Uh, and we see there. Um, let's see. Oh, someone on the uh, Slack here says some they take 5-HTP. Uh, well, so let's, I'm gonna ask that uh, person, uh, and Tori's in the background. Tori, could you send an email to our uh, wonderful medical director or to me to remind me to do so? Cause again, I'm old, I forget things, you know, I, I forget what my name is. Who am I? What? Wait, who who are all these? Why are these? Oh my God. Okay. Oh yes, it's the webinar. Tori, could you uh, do that though? And we'll get that taken care of. All right. What are tips for clients struggling with rumination? All right. Not Roomba Nation, which would be your Roomba vacuum going wild all over your carpet, but rumination, which is your thoughts going wild all over your head. So uh, here, here's what I would say. One of the things happening with rumination is, well, trying to figure stuff out, right? I mean, if you think about it, OCD asks a lot of unanswerable questions. And if there's a lot of unanswerable questions floating out there, but you have OCD, you have a disorder that tells you that you got to find the answer parentheses, but it's unanswerable, close parentheses, continue sentence, but you got to find the answer. So you're kind of stuck, right? You're, you're Sisyphus. If anyone knows who Sisyphus is, one of my favorite stories in the Greek legends, Sisyphus angered the gods and they sent him down to Hades, but they played a trick on him. They said, hey, Sisyphus, yo, come over here. You, Sisyphus, can get out of Hades as long as you go over there, see that stone, see that hill, you get that stone to the top of that hill, you're out of here. You're a demigod, actually. We'll convert your human little butt into a god. You'll be a demigod. And Sisyphus is like, oh, sweet. All right. But the gods played a trick on him. The stone is one pound too heavy. The hill is one degree too steep. And the stone rolls back down every single time Sisyphus attempts to get the stone to the top of the hill, which means, well, Sisyphus has stuck for eternity in Hades attempting to do something that was made impossible to do. And that may be what it's like to live in OCD world where OCD tells you to get an answer for something and think about it and think about it and think about it and think about it and eventually you'll find it, parentheses, but guess what? You'll never actually find it. Close parentheses. Instead of ruminating and trying to figure something out, I would like people to work on accepting the fact that I'll never have an answer to that that will be satisfying and to be able to move on. Because that's ultimately where we'd like to go with people is how do you accept the fact that you may not have an answer for something that will ever be satisfying to your OCD and then move on, right? It's just kind of what you have to do. There's plenty of things in our world that we don't know exactly why they work the way that they do, but we accept that they work the way that they do, and so we're good with it. Now, there's plenty of smart people who are attempting to figure that out, but those jobs end at maybe you know 5 o'clock at night, and then they punch out, and they go home, and they take care of themselves and their kids and everything like that. They don't then go home, hopefully, and spend all their time trying to figure that out at home and spend their entire life only on that thing. But when you have OCD, that's what your OCD would like you to do. Your friends don't really matter. Your family doesn't really matter. That job doesn't really matter. But figuring out this question sure does. It is the most important thing in the world for you to do. Therefore, if you would just do that before anything else, all will be good. Keep that in mind. Asher says, does unresolved, un <laughs> unresolved anger exacerbate OCD symptoms? Well, it could, sure. Anything could exacerbate OCD symptoms. I mean, abs absolutely. 
There's no doubt about that. Uh, stress, anger, frustration, whatever, things could lead to OCD getting worse because OCD could always say, don't like that feeling, do you? Well, if you do what I tell you to do, everything will be okay. So why don't you just, uh, why don't you just try that instead? See how that goes. Go for that. All right. Get the little skip there where it jumps 900 way people. So there we go. My opinion, great name, by the way. Uh, what is the best thing to do when you just want to hide in bed under the covers? Uh, you know, I'll tell you, some days that sounds lovely, doesn't it? I mean, just, I, I could use a day of covers. Uh, I felt this way yesterday, realized I was hiding from the fear. Oh, there's the difference. Okay. Yet the fear is under the covers with me in the brain. Yeah, you know, one thing that's interesting about OCD is that no matter where you go, your brain happens to go with you. So you can't hide away from OCD because it's always there with you inside of your brain. So it's impossible to run away from OCD. So my opinion, what's the best thing to do? Learn to live your life even though you have OCD and teach OCD that it's not gonna be in control of your life. That is the number one, absolutely number one thing that you can possibly do. Even though the last thing you probably wanna do is get out of bed because you're just done with this crap and, and you feel overwhelmed by it. Get out of bed, go live your life. And at the end of the day, when you've actually accomplished something, say <laughs> to your OCD, and show it that it's not going to rule your life and be in control of everything anymore. That's what I would do. I think you'll do great if you do that. Joe, is a degree of blocking out or denial about OCD okay and healthy after a long period of time, after therapy and being aware of your condition? I don't know that you're blocking it out or denying about it, denying it, Joe. I think that you're able to say, uh, yeah, it's there, but it doesn't have any impact on my life, and I'm just moving on. And if it ever does try to uh, you know, raise its ugly little head up again, you just go, oh, you, yeah, uh, annoyance, be gone. And then you you move on. So I don't really know that you're, you're uh, denying it there or blocking it. I, I think that you acknowledge and move on. And, and boy, that's been my theme the last few weeks, even with the patients that I've been working with as well, too. How do we acknowledge and move on? Let's acknowledge and move on. Yep, there's the OCD. Okay, great. I'm going to acknowledge and move on. And that's all that I need to do. I think if you do that, you're going to feel really a lot better than if you have to spend time trying to push it away, deny it, something of that nature. Darren, can OCD make you make facial expressions you don't intend? Well, there are some people I've seen who have OCD who have thoughts that they, or images or urges that they find gross, and they just naturally go like, arr, 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 you know, or something like that. You know, it's almost as if I have to show my disgust about something, and if I don't show the disgust, it must mean that I like it. So I have to do everything that I can to show the disgust or shame or guilt or whatever it is that I experience about this thing, or else it means that I might actually like this thing. So those facial expressions, I don't know that it's making you have them, but they're probably some involuntary reactions and they're ways that you show shame or disgust or something like that. Joe says, isn't that more like a normal person? Joe, welcome to hopefully being a normal person, whatever the hell a normal person is, by the way. But uh, yeah, I, I think so. And I think that you could do that. Are you familiar with SSRIs and SNRIs? Thinking about medication, would love any thoughts you have on the differences. Um, you know what I think we'll do, Tori, uh, if you could also remind me, let's get uh, our, our wonderful medical director, Dr. Jamie on here, and we'll do a, a Q and A around medications for OCD as well too. So that'll be one of our, our special guests that we'll do. So there we go. Got a question from Tori on the Instas. Can you talk about ERP exercises for existential OCD? Sure, one of my favorite ones, uh, and I would do it right with you if I could, because I love them. Watch the Matrix movies. You want a great mind screw about what's real or not real, and we'll get you to start thinking about things as being real or not real. Watch the Matrix movies, really awesome. And the scene with the architect may be one of the greatest scenes ever filmed in the history of all movies, and I show it to patients all the time. And if you just want to see that scene, go to YouTube and type in Neo and the architect and watch that scene. And 
that scene touches all sorts of things about OCD, existential OCD, perfectionism. It, it's just such a great, great scene, and I highly recommend people watch it. So check it out. David Jones, awesome. Um, do you have any tips for how to handle intrusive thoughts when you're feeling weak or discouraged? OCD tends to be more frightening in those moments because it feels like you have less control. Uh, well, first of all, I would contend you never have more or less control than any other time in your life. Control is an illusion. Uh, I don't have control over blinking my eyes. They happen. It just does it once in a while. I don't have control totally over sleeping. Eventually, I'm going to fall asleep. I just moved my fingers. I didn't even think about it. Why did they move? I have no idea. Um, so uh, I don't look at this in terms of a, a feeling of control. Now, what do we know this? We know that sometimes when people are harder or, or uh, sleepier, that, that it's harder to deal with OCD. We know that when, when people maybe are just waking up, it might be more difficult to deal with OCD. We know when people are stressed, it might be more difficult to deal with OCD. We know that when they're frustrated, they might be have a harder time dealing with OCD because OCD is opportunistic and will take over whatever it possibly can or take advantage of whatever it possibly can as a way to worm itself into the situation. So if your normal stoic self is ready to challenge and take on the OCD, but today you got some bad news or, you know, maybe, maybe your, your, your favorite goldfish died or something like that. And you're a little down and discouraged OCD is like, Ooh, well, here's a chance. I can take this in and I can take advantage of it and try to, try to reassert myself and dominate this experience all over again. And that's because OCD is uh, basically a poopy head and uh, it sucks. And so that's what it does because that's what sucky poopy heads do. So, you know, just recognize that that's what OCD is going to do in this very situation. Reminder, once again, everybody, we're a third of the way through already. Welcome all of you. And this is our weekly Wednesday night webinar with NoCD. I am Dr. Patrick McGrath, your host, head of clinical services for NoCD. And NoCD has therapists all over the country ready to work with you. And we continue to get more and more insurance companies that cover us as well, too, so we can make this as affordable as possible for all of you. So check us out at NoCD.com or TreatMyOCD.com and download our app at Google Play or iOS. Rodolfo, what's a good way to avoid any type of intrusive thought? I know some people say let them in, but I don't want to let them in. Well, uh, Rodolfo, then I have no idea what to do to help you because I don't know a way to avoid any type of intrusive thought. In fact, Rodolfo, in treating OCD now for 21 years, I have adopted every single intrusive thought that pretty much every one of my patients has ever had. So if I pick up a salt shaker, I assume there's poison in it. If if I hit a bump, I figure I probably ran somebody over. If I see children, there's thoughts, what if I molested them? If I see older adults, there's what if I beat them up? Um, you cannot treat OCD without just absorbing these things into your head. And Rodolfo, I guarantee if you and I were ever standing at the top of a staircase, I would think about throwing you down the stairs because I've treated people for that as well. So it's not about stopping these intrusive thoughts and it's not about making them go away. It's about learning that just because they're there doesn't mean I have to pay any attention to them. Now, if you wanna be the human being who figures out how to never have an intrusive thought, uh, I say, let us know if you ever figure it out. You will be a billionaire because everyone will buy your book or whatever 17 HTTPPSSJKIL you, you develop to have people take so that intrusive thoughts will stop and go away and no one will ever have to deal with them again. But until that date, every single human being on this planet has to deal with intrusive thoughts or images or urges, and it's just the way it goes. And then, Rodolfo, you might say, well, that's fine, but I don't want it in this one area. I'll take them any other place, but I don't want them in this area, which goes to everyone knows what's coming. One of my favorite examples, the pink elephant. Because if you say, don't think of a pink elephant, that's what you think of. And if you say, don't think this intrusive thought, that's what you think of. So, Rodolfo, you've just pink elephanted yourself if that's the case, all right? So it's not about not thinking about something. It's frankly about not giving a crap that you did because it's just a stupid thought anyway. 
or image or urge, whatever it is. Hopefully that helps. Skylar finds that their OCD is severely affecting their attention and concentration, especially while reading or studying. What is the correlation between OCD and ADHD? How about this? Uh, there is a correlation between the two, but this is not an ADHD problem that you have, Skylar. This is an OCD problem because, yes, OCD often gets confused as ADHD because people assume since you're not paying attention, you must have ADHD when the reality is you're not paying attention because you're doing obsessions and compulsions in your head so much that it's interfering in your ability to focus on anything else. So I'm not going to throw an ADHD diagnosis on you here, Skylar. I'm going to say you probably have so much OCD going on that that's the thing that's getting in the way. Okay. Ellie says, I have an OCD theme which makes me overanalyze whether or not I'm being odd or have thoughts or act in a way that's odd, but I have no idea what to call it. Well, it's odd, obviously. I mean, let's just call it that, odd OCD. Uh, maybe we'll just OCDD and, and we'll, let's kind of gives you the odd piece of it as well too. But whatever we call it or not call it or whatever it is, um, I would say this. Go out and act odd purposely and allow yourself to learn that you can handle acting odd. And if you go out and act odd personally, purposely and you realize that, frankly, nobody gives a crap about you acting odd or you don't show up on the news because you're acting odd or anything like that, then who the heck cares if you act odd? Just just go and act odd and just be odd. What what the heck? I mean, that, that's fine, you know. Um, I'm gonna act odd for all of you right now. <laughs> okay, there. That was weird and odd, and uh, some of you may be judging me right now for it. And frankly, I I don't care. Um, that's fine. Judge away. If you don't like me, it's not affecting me. But I. But I want you to like me. No, I don't care, really. It's, I mean, I, and I say I don't care in the nicest way possible, but there are people who don't like me, right? That just happens. It's part of the world. There are people who think I'm weird. There's people who don't like the beard. There's people who don't like the longer hair. I mean, there's, there's always going to be somebody who doesn't like something about me and you and everybody else. If I let my entire life be ruled by that, I'm never going to leave the house because I'm going to think, well, I'm really in a quandary now because there are some people who find long hair attractive, but there's some people who find short hair attractive, and then there's some people who find bald attractive. How can I be attractive to everybody if I leave the house without figuring out first if I should be bald, have short hair, or long hair? What, what should I do? Or should I just not care? I'm going to go with not really caring so much, and I'm going to go with the fact that, you know what, I can be odd. And I cannot care if anybody else thinks I'm odd and I can purposely be odd and even make it happen and laugh at the fact that I've made it happen and it doesn't really matter. That's what I want you to do. In fact, Ellie, in support of all of you, everyone on this call tonight, tomorrow, just do something odd. And then next week, come back and tell me if it, if it what you did and I'd love to hear what you did and how it went. I think that that would be fun. All right. What's an example of exposure for somatic OCD, like breathing, wanting to time and count breathing in and out, feeling like you don't know how long to do it for? Well, why do you have to know how long you do it for? Uh, it would be really hard for me to do this, this uh, webinar if that was the case, but we're going to try. Okay, so hi, everybody. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. 10. Okay, that's my breathing out. So good to talk to all of you. Wait, I don't have any more here. Hold on. One, I have to inhale now for seven. One, two, three. Oh, boy, it's really hard to inhale and talk at the same time because you have to exhale when you talk. Hold on. All right, everybody. So it's really great talking to all of you. I'm really glad that you're all here. It's been fun uh, to have the week of working with people who have OCD and really helping them and making sure that everybody's okay. And oh, that's 10. Hold on. It'd be impossible for me to do tonight if I had to do that, right? So, uh, frankly, if you're still alive, you're breathing, why the count of breathing? Why, why does that matter in the slightest? 
What does one have to do? When you're doing that, you're just doing it at the satisfaction of OCD. And remember when we're doing exposure and response prevention therapy, we're trying to go against the satisfaction of OCD, not toward the satisfaction of OCD. We're not here to make your OCD feel better, okay? We're here to challenge your OCD. That's why we're here. So uh, I don't want you counting about breathing. I just want you to breathe. And I want you to learn that you can handle it. That's what I want you to do. Okay. Try that out and see how it goes. Let me know. Can OCD obsession episodes cause mania? Not, not that I've ever seen. I, I mean, I can't say 100% no, but I've not seen it personally. I've been navigating OCD for 28 years now, and it wasn't until a few years ago that I realized that intrusive thoughts can follow you into your dreams. Have you heard of this before? Sure, we can dream about anything, right? Uh, just like if you watch a movie and you see someone really attractive, then you might dream about them later. Or, uh, you know, everyone thinks I'm crazy. Well, Carl does anyway, about my, my absolute devotion to the greatest band in the history of the world. There they are. Rush, my Rush bobbleheads. And about once a month, I have a dream that I'm on stage with Rush. I'm either singing or playing an instrument or something with them. Um, so, you know, it, it turns out that the things that are important to me are the things that I dream about. So could OCD uh, stuff happen in your dreams? Sure, absolutely. No doubt about it. Ben says, how do you deal with feelings of loss, resentment, and anger over years wasted with untreated OCD? Uh, well, the same way that uh, I, I would say people that I'm really proud of. You know, there are, there are people in our country who the justice system has failed, who have been in jail for years for a crime they didn't commit. And there are some of them who come out angry and frustrated, but there are also others who come out and say, you know what? I got to go live my life. That's what I'm going to do. I don't have time to be angry. I don't have time to be sad. I've, I've lost enough of my life. It's time to go live my life, right? Uh, to quote one of my favorite movies ever, Shawshank Redemption, Ben, get busy living or get busy dying. What are you going to do? And Ben, what advice would you give to somebody else? Let's say, Ben, somebody had cancer for you know 15 years and then then there was a cure. Would you tell them to be angry over the 15 wasted years that they had cancer or would you tell them to celebrate life now that they have the attempt to live life without cancer and i'm hoping you would say go live your life and ben that's what i want you to do too well i feel for you that you've lost years to ocd and it feels that way you know what you gotta move forward right you can live the rest of your life regretting what you lost to OCD, or you could go live your life and show OCD that you're not going to let it ruin anything else anymore. That's what I want you to do. JP says, Dr. McGrath, what can you tell me about sharing that I have OCD with my boss, ah, who is truly amazing? Is that a sign of weakness? No, well, JP, if your boss is amazing, then I would say, uh, hey, boss, I want to thank you for your support and your work and what we do here. And I want you to know that you've created a company where someone like me, and I've never told you this before, but someone like me who has OCD can function and thrive. And I don't know if that was a goal of yours or not, probably not, but I want you to know that this is a business, a company that is affirming for people who have mental health concerns. And um, I'm proud to work here. I think that your boss would just love to hear something like that. So that would be cool. And OCD Crusher says, uh, don't forget Rush is the best band ever. Yes, thank you, Crusher. That is, that is always the same. Caroline struggling with rumination. I hope that answer I gave earlier helps. Tara J., uh, when doing ERP for POCD with uh, main most distressing symptoms being groinals, yes, the old groinal, that old tingly feeling down there, what to do when you notice that sensation? Lean into it, make it stronger, try to do nothing, 
but oh no, what if I wasn't able to and still felt it? And how do you stop compulsively telling myself that the sensation proves I'm this, or I think I wanted it and it felt good, so it confirms my fears, etc. cetera. Um, I mean, I could go out when I go shopping this week and purposely make myself feel a little groinal whenever I see uh, kids or adolescents or whatever shopping, if, if I wanted to. What would that say about me then that I made that happen? that I purposely put that thought in my head. Would it mean now that I should quit my job because that says something about me and who I am? Or is the groinal kind of the result of the OCD and the desire not to have a feeling and the focus on hoping that I don't have a feeling? And of course, the more I hope I don't have a feeling, the more likely I am to have a feeling because the more I try not to think of something, what happens? The pink elephant happens. That's what happens. Once again, there it is. It appears once again, the pink elephant. There's the pink elephant's butt, by the way. So, you know, again, the more you try not to have a groinal, the more you're experiencing a pink elephant experience, right? And the more you go into situations hoping that you don't have that groinal experience, the more likely you are to have the groinal experience. And the more likely you are to be on the lookout for the groinal experience, which is only going to do things to create the groinal experience as well too. So I would say this, Tara, fully embrace and accept the groinal as being there. It is what it is. It doesn't have to mean anything. It just is a bodily sensation and that's all. And just embrace the fact that you've had it and move on. Continue your shopping, continue your party that you're at with the family or whatever it is that you're doing because it doesn't have to mean anything at all. Well, one of our former presidents, Warren G. Harding, is here tonight. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President. Good good to see you. I've suffered from severe scrupulosity, religious OCD for most of my life. Only recently heard about ERP. Where I where can I begin? Well, frankly, why don't you check out the No CD app? Download it at treatmyocd.com or nocd.com or go to Google Play or iOS and check out teletherapy with no CD because we have therapists all over the country who could potentially help you with your scrupulosity concerns. So that's where I would go. But if you don't even go with no CD, which is fine too, at least get a therapist who practices exposure and response prevention therapy because that's the kind of treatment that you really should do. Tracy says, I don't know how to identify compulsions for somatic OCD. For example, breathing or swallowing. You can't just not breathe. I don't know if it sounds like a stupid question. Well, it's not a stupid question. But what you could do is breathe wrong or swallow wrong. Like, hold on, I'm going to, I'll take a drink of water. Hold on. I'm going to swallow wrong now. Okay, well, I still swallowed and it still went down. So, um, now that I've swallowed wrong, what's going to happen to me? Or let me breathe wrong. <clears throat> okay, I breathe weird there. Um, what's going to happen to me now? Because uh, I did it wrong. I didn't do it the way that I normally do. Um, turns out I can swallow wrong or breathe wrong, and it doesn't mean anything. Uh, so if it doesn't mean anything for you, Tracy, I'm going to go with it doesn't mean anything for you. So what I want you to do is to try to do the opposite of anything that OCD tells you to do, because what OCD tells you to do is a lie and stupid and don't give into it. That's what I want you to do. Lisa says she's preparing for a major life adjustment for her family. She's heard that major life change like that can cause your OCD to go into a tailspin and get worse. Well, it can uh, lead you to, um, to feel worse. Absolutely. Stressors can create, you know, situations where OCD, again, wants to worm itself in. So, Lisa, what I would do is if you know the kind of OCD that you have and you're comfortable and familiar with working on it and you've done ERP for it, ramp up that ERP now so that when that stressor comes, you'll already be ahead of the game. That's what I would do. JP has another question. Would you consider impulsive shopping or the urge to shop a compulsion? I usually get the urge or given to it when my OCD is a high peak. Well, it could be a combination of hoarding as well too and acquisition or it could also be a distraction. Maybe the shopping is a way to distract yourself from the feelings that you're having. So sometimes we use the comp word compulsive, but there would have to be an obsession that goes along with that as well too. This could be more of a distraction. Sarah Elizabeth says, I find my mind comparing my current relationship to my first big love a lot. 
and there's a lot she says thinking about how my ex made me more nervous uh think about my ex sorry made me more nervous i felt more attracted trying to sit with the thoughts any other tools yeah well well that's it you know hindsight's always 2020 we can always look at people from our past and we we typically start to remember just the good stuff and not the reasons why we broke up with someone or what happened like that and so it's not really fair in many ways to compare who we're with now to who we were back then. Uh, a lot of times I call previous relationships the ghosts, right? And uh, they're always like Casper the Friendly Ghost. They're not the crappy ghosts. They're Casper the Friendly Ghost. And, and I think most of us are probably haunted by a ghost, by a previous relationship that we just can't ever get out of our head and they'll always be with us no matter who we are or what we're doing or who we're with at that point in time. And uh, the ghost is just kind of there, right? And so I think that your best thing to do is to make friends with the ghost and just recognize that, yeah, the ghost is there. It's along for the ride, but it doesn't also have to interfere with what I have going on right now as well. I don't have to let it get in the way, but I accept that the ghost is there and that's just the way that it is. So see how that works. See if that helps. Jacob says, I've battled OCD unknowingly for most of my life until I faced a really tough theme regarding fear of schizophrenia. I felt myself getting better until recently when I fell back into the trap of worry. Well, then Jacob, go back to doing what you were doing when it was getting you better because it worked and get out of the trap. That's the best thing that I can tell you. If you were already doing something that was already working, go back to doing that thing again, because we know that it can work. Can OCD trigger depersonalized and detached feelings? I hate that sensation. Well, OCD can trigger panic sensations, and some of the panic sensations can be derealization or depersonalization or feeling detached. So yeah, absolutely, absolutely that can happen. If my OCD symptoms have subsided hugely, i.g. Little, e. little to no rumination, but I still respond to triggers, what do I do? Purposely do ERP then to those triggers so that you learn how to respond differently to those triggers. That's the only way that you're going to overcome it is to purposely put yourself in the situation with those triggers and learn how to handle those triggers. Can having DPDR, uh, I'm going to go with depersonalization or derealization and OCD make each other worse, like I feel they're almost best friends. I'm thinking that's what that is, but I'm not too sure if that's the case. So if you let me know, Jacob, what you meant by that, I apologize. I'm not familiar with the DPDR. Sorry. Uh, Shell or Shelly, maybe? My therapist confuses me. Okay, she says, make a hierarchy of my obsessions, but then sends me exposure ideas for my scariest obsession. It makes me so uncomfortable. Anyone experience this? So sometimes there, there's a couple of different theories out there right now about treating OCD. One looks at inhib inhibitory learning and says, maybe start at higher things or surprise people with things or move all around the hierarchy. Other people look more at the habituation model and take a look at building up on the hierarchy. That's what I usually do with people is building up on the hierarchy with folks because otherwise I get a lot of these kinds of questions and it scares people away and then they don't know if they want to do ERP anymore. My goal in ERP is to build people up the ladder so that they learn how to handle things. And that's what I would want to do with you as well too, just so you know. Okay, let's see. Uh, and we jumped again. Um, let me find back where I was. One moment. There we go. Boy, this thing just jumps around sometimes. My apologies, everybody. All right. <laughs> How does one override millions of years of evolution and simply not have thoughts? You don't. It's not about not having thoughts. It's really about recognizing that just because you have them doesn't mean that you have to give them any credit or, or spend much time with them. So for example, uh, I've done this one here before, but I'll do it again. There is a good possibility by the uh, time that this is done, I will leave this webinar I will go across the street, 
I will uh, set my neighbor's house on fire with a Molotov cocktail. I will poop in the middle of the street on my way back, and then I will take it and I will throw it at one of my other neighbor's houses. Okay, uh, that, that is a possibility. A reality, probably not so high, but it is a possibility. So now uh, I'm not gonna try to not think that thought. In, in fact, I'm gonna purposely think that thought for a while. I'm just gonna recognize that just because I think it doesn't mean that I have to do anything about it whatsoever. Can the feeling of anxiety make you feel like you're lying to yourself when you ask yourself a question? And how common is analysis paralysis in OCD? Well, there's a heck of a lot of analysis paralysis in OCD, that's for darn sure. Um, and, you know, lying, yeah, o OCD can lead you to feel kind of anything, you know, then that can become a compulsion. Well, how do I know that I'm telling myself the truth? How do I know that I actually believe this? Now I got to do some compulsive behaviors or mental acts around that to make sure that I do. So sure, that, that could absolutely happen. But if you recognize it as OCD, then maybe you can dismiss it as OCD as well too, right? And, and maybe just recognize that. I'm going to bet most people in the world aren't sitting around all day wondering if they're lying to themselves or not. They're just kind of going about their day. And that is what most people do. They just go about their day. They don't kind of consider, now that last thought, was that a lie to myself or was that the truth? Well, let's spend the next 15 minutes trying to figure that out. No, nobody nobody else really does that unless it's people with OCD. That, that's who does that. Zoya says, every time I get triggered, I have to write down a word for word every thought I just had that triggered me and how these thoughts relate to my theme and why it triggered me. How do I stop this? Uh, very easy. Throw away your pen and pencil and don't write things down anymore and recognize that writing things down is a compulsion and you don't need to do that. So that's the first thing that you do because, frankly, who cares, right? Why does it really matter? So you don't have to analyze that anymore. You already know that you have a theme of OCD. You know that it leads you to have some thoughts and things that pop in your head now and then. Just go with the fact that that's what happens and you don't have to do anything else about it. Give it a go. Do I think OCD and anxiety is a spiritual battle? I don't think it's a spiritual battle, but I know that it can take on the form of spirituality with scrupulosity, and it can use scrup uh, spirituality in scrupulosity to kind of get you to doubt a lot of things. So I think that that's probably what, what I would see happen. I always doubt if any object lying around me would be seen again and again while doing my task. Then I try not to see it, but it is seen every time and I get anxious about it, how to deal with it. Um, I guess I'm a little confused on that one. I don't really know. Uh, if you're worried about seeing something uh, again and again, uh, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm just a bit confused on that one. So maybe if you could let me know a little bit more in depth what you're talking about with that. I would, I would appreciate it. So my apologies. I avoid the room where I had my first intrusive thought. Is this a compulsion? Yes, uh, absolutely. I'm scared to be there. Then Caroline, go back in that room and sit in there and recognize that you can handle being in that room. That room has no magical powers. I have intrusive thoughts all over the place. I have tons of them here as I'm working with patients and I talk about intrusive thoughts. That means that I should avoid these webinars anymore and not do them anymore because this is the spot where I experience many intrusive thoughts as I learn about the intrusive thoughts about other people. So um, yeah, go back into that room, sit in that room until you recognize you can handle it. Carl says he likes mindfulness meditation uh, and it helps him a great deal. Is he right in saying response prevention is just a form of mindfulness? Well, I think response prevention is more of an act that one does to purposely not give in to the compulsion. So, if if not giving in to the compulsion means I'm uh, you know not going to wash my hands when my compulsion is to wash my hands, I don't see that as a form of mindfulness. I see that as an act that actively challenges what I do to maintain OCD because now I'm going to purposely do something that gets in the way of the maintenance of OCD. How do you move, I'm sorry, how do you acknowledge and move on with it when it's the theme is our OCD? 
it feels more difficult. Uh, Woody Vixen, uh, if if POCD was your issue, you would say the same thing as POCD. And if and if harm OCD was your issue, you would say it's the same as harm OCD. Every single person with whatever type of OCD they have says to me, yeah, I could do that in any other type of OCD, but it's more difficult when it's this type. And the reality is, no, it's not any more difficult that, with that type than it is in any other type. That just happens to be the type that you have, and that's why it feels more difficult. But it's actually not any more difficult whatsoever, just so you know. How do you not focus on the severe anxiety with the thoughts? I can accept and move on from the thoughts, but the feelings draw my complete attention. Okay, so that's what your OCD is really building on then. Your OCD is trying to get you to snag into this by saying, oh, now that you're feeling this, now you have to pay attention to it. So I want you to continue to do your ERP and recognize that even though you feel something intensely, doesn't also mean that you have to pay attention to it, right? So. I could feel very intensely fear that I'm going to run across the street, throw a Molotov cocktail in my neighbor's house, poop in the middle of the street, and then throw it at another neighbor's house. But I still don't have to worry about it or pay much attention to it, even though I'm really feeling some intense things about it, right? Because it just kind of is what it is. Now, that's hard to do. I'm not saying this is easy by any means whatsoever. So don't don't read into that by any means at all. I'm not saying that this is easy to do, but I do want you to recognize that I want you to learn how to handle this stuff. That's what I want you to do. That's always our goal, learn how to handle it. I'm working on contamination and my therapist added to my exposure to not wash my sheets till I see her. I feel washing sheets is normal hygiene. How can you say a normal thing is OCD? Um, you know, when I was in college, I think I washed my sheets maybe once a semester, seemed to have survived. Now I probably do it maybe once every two weeks, probably. Um, so, I think it kind of depends here. When you say a normal thing is OCD, are you washing your sheets every day? Because I don't think that's normal. And you know, we used to do, when I was at the hospital, we would take surveys and we would get surveys about when someone said, well, this is normal, everybody does this. So we'd say, okay, well, let's do a survey. And we'd find out almost every survey we did that what the person with OCD said was normal was absolutely not normal and what not what anybody else did. And that was surveying people who also had OCD, but they didn't share their type of OCD, so they didn't do the things that that person did in their type of OCD. So kind of keep that in mind. Go with what your therapist is saying. Give it a try. See how it goes. Jacob says, when I'm spiraling with intrusive thoughts, it feels so suffocating at times. Like my mind is a dome that is building with pressure from all of the thoughts flooding it. Blah. Yeah, well, uh, Jacob, I can, uh, I hear you, right? And, and um, that's, again, OCD throwing the tantrum that it can to get you to kind of do the ritual or the compulsion so that then you'll give it into it and then it will give you the really relief of those spiraling thoughts and images and urges stopping, right? And it's going to say to you, until you do the ritual or compulsion, I'm not going to stop these things. So it kind of becomes this idea, this battle of wills. Who's going to win here? Who's going to outlast the other one? Are you always going to give in when OCD does that and say, okay, fine, OCD, I'll do the compulsion if you just stop that? Or are you going to say, hey, OCD, I've decided that no matter what you throw at me anymore, I'm not going to do the compulsion, and I'm just going to see what happens if I don't do the compulsion. Jacob, I hope you get to that point. That's where we would want you to go to. That's what we want you to know that you can handle. How do you overcome um, decision paralysis and mental checking to constantly see if the decision feels right? Thanks so much. Well, when you have OCD, feels right changes all the time, right? Because the just right experience today could be doing something maybe 10 times and tomorrow might be 78 times. So um, I would say this, that uh, you're, you're never going to do something until it feels just right. And even if you do get to the just right feeling, 
it doesn't mean that the next time that same number or same way feels just right. And if you've done it just right once, why do you have to do it just right again? I mean, isn't once enough or do, do you have to now do it just right multiple times? And you're gonna get to a point where just doing this over and over and just right and just right so much is going to lead you to not wanting to do it at all, right? Hopefully, that's what we want you to do. Just not do it at all according to the way that OCD wants you to do. Uh, we want you to just, just do it. Just do it, but not do it in the way that OCD wants. That's where we want to go. Hey, you know what? I'm going to go to this party, even though I've got these thoughts swimming in my head, and I'm going to do whatever I can to have a good time and enjoy the party and recognize that just because these thoughts are in my head doesn't mean that I have to do anything for OCD. I'm only going to do things for myself. That's what I'm going to do. Someone's working with a therapist who doesn't know about OCD. She's receptive when I teach her how to not feed my compulsions. Curious about your thoughts. I'm working with a non-OCD therapist for other issues. I think you could probably work on a non with a non-OCD therapist for other issues, but I wouldn't work on a non-OCD therapist for OCD. I just wouldn't. I don't think that it's, uh, it's going to really do anything good for you whatsoever. Manet says, uh, likes my use of humor. Thanks. Makes things less scary. That's my goal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm having, this is Debbie. I'm having an extremely hard time focusing on school and studying. I'm normally a straight A student, so this is scary that I'm forgetting words and other things that I know, but just can't recall. Yeah, OCD will do that, right? It's, it's hard to encode things when OCD's uh, running all over the place. I had treated someone once who was afraid every time they looked at a number, a bomb would go off. So she wasn't paying any attention in school because every time she looked up, there was a clock over the teacher and she'd see the clock and she'd have to count up to the number that she saw on the clock. And then that would just interfere all day long with her schooling. And then she was failing out of classes. So OCD loves to screw with things that you love. So if you're really like in school, that's the thing that OCD is going to find a way to kind of really screw with. So, Cause as, as uh, Carl and Tori said up there, OCD is basically a poopy head. So just everyone remember that it's OCD is a poopy head. Okay. How do you explain a guilt trigger that led to intrusive thoughts but haven't had any intrusive thoughts for 10 plus years? Uh, well, OCD is always there. It doesn't necessarily go away. And maybe you're having just kind of an off day and OCD perceived, oh, here's my chance to resurge and come on back. And <clears throat> there, there it is. It, it does its poopy head thing. And... Um, so it jumped in, but just do what you know how to do already. You've been doing it for 10 years and say, oh, OCD, you, you, you rascal, you little scoundrel, you. I see what you're trying to do, and I'm just not going to let that happen. So back, back with you, Mr. Miss OCD, back to where you belong, because you belong in the depths of, of the poopy head world in the back of my brain, not in the forefront of it where all the unicorns are pooping rainbows and doing all sorts of fun things. That's that's what I want in the front of my brain, not the OCD things. Okay. Zoya says, I'm not getting specific thoughts or urges right now, but I still don't feel good. Usually if I stop doing compulsions for my false memories, I get clarity, but not this time. I think I'm doing sneaky compulsions. Well, wonderful insight there, Zoya. I think that you probably are too. And if you need, you know, it might be, uh, behoove you to check in with a therapist to see if they can help you figure out what some of those sneaky little compulsions might be. Oh, Lilia says, uh, I also worked with a therapist who didn't know much about OCD, but now I'm with an OCD therapist and doing ERP. It's incredible how helpful therapy has been. Wonderful. I, Doc, is harm OCD the worst of OCD? Well, if you have OC, harm OCD, you think it is. But if you have contamination OCD, you think that's the worst. And if you have existential, you think that's the worst. And if you have pedophilic OCD, you think that's the worst. And if you have scrupulous OCD, you think that's the worst. And so basically, anyone who has their kind of OCD thinks that's the worst kind of OCD, just so you know. <laughs> So I am 90% better, and the last thing is saying a prayer I do not want to say. Can I get better without this crushing blow, existential and religious OCD? You know, um, 
I, I worked with someone with scrupulosity years ago who said everything they did, they had to be for God, you know, even if they stood up. And they, it would take them 15 minutes just to stand up from a chair because of all the prayers he had to do to make sure he was doing it for God. So my last thing to him was do something for yourself and not for God. He said, I can't do that. I can't do that. I won't do that. I won't do that. I won't do it. I said, I fear you're going to be back here if that's the case. Two weeks later, he was back, and he was back to where he was when he started. Second time around, I said, all right, here's your opportunity again. You got to do something for yourself. And he did. And guess what? He didn't come back. And it's not because he just went to another therapist. We stayed in touch. He didn't come back because he finally learned that he could handle that. So sometimes even those last ERPs are things we really don't want to do, but we need to do in order to learn how to handle. Uh, after a first therapy session, my OCD feels worse. Yes, Tyler, that happens all the time, actually, because OCD is going to try to get you to not do therapy, and it's going to try to scare you away from therapy and, and kind of rear its ugly head. And uh, so, Tyler, stick through that. It's an extinction burst. Happens all the time. Very common. Um, you can see this even when you decide it's time to put kids to bed and tonight if they if they want mom or dad to come in we're not going to answer them and what do you see more screaming than you ever thought you could ever hear in your entire life and eventually it goes away uh that's what ocd does too when it doesn't get answered and doesn't give what it doesn't get what it's want what it wants oh jacob how nice jacob says i would he says, you're awesome. I would definitely think about throwing you down the stairs. That's that's awesome. That's great, Jason. I Or Jacob. Uh, I would love that, Jacob. And let's let's one day meet up and, and consider throwing each other off of a bridge or something like that together and recognize that our thoughts don't make things happen. So so that would be that would be really cool. And Tyler, you're getting other people there say uh, the same thing happened to me. The same thing happened to me. Yeah. So, so that's, that's great. Awesome. All right. Good stuff, everybody. Some good things about no CD therapy. That's great. <laughs> ben says someone with, no, I should make a Dr. McGrath out of context compilation. Yeah, if you take a few things just that I've said tonight, uh, I could probably go to jail uh, if they were just reported to somebody like that. So that would be kind of humorous. But hey, guess what? I say them all the time. And these are recorded and these are going to live on the internet forever. And I still say this stuff all the time. Why? Because I don't care. Because they're just words. That's all that it is. And if anyone's going to get me in trouble for it, I will stand up proudly in court as I have for other people and say, I'm just talking about OCD and this is why, and it gets dismissed every time. So congratulations. We know what we're doing here. All right. We are coming toward the end here. Uh, let's see if we get another question or two says, why is it always said as what if thoughts when OCD can come as commands. Yeah, it can. It can, like, do this, right? To, or, or push that person off off the train station into something. But that's usually then also followed with, oh my gosh, what if I did that? That would be awful. That would be horrible. I better do whatever I can to prevent that from happening. So that uh, that is kind of the way that it goes. So there may be a command, but even that's typically followed by kind of a what if experience as well, too. Well, everyone, it's been a fun and exciting time with all of you here. Uh, I always enjoy these uh, these times together. I hope that this has been helpful to all of you. And um, I hope that all of you doing no CD therapy find it to be helpful. That's awesome. That's great. And, um, you know, all of you are brave. You're on honest about it. You're letting me know about it. You even let me poke a little fun at your OCD sometimes, which I do because I hate your OCD. So I'm going to tease the crap out of it because it sucks because it's a poopy head. Uh, but I never tease or make fun of anybody who has OCD because I know what it's like, how serious it is. So um, that's what we're going to keep on doing. We're going to be 
you're going to be minions against the OCD together, and we're going to work against OCD taking over people's lives. So once again, everyone, thanks for being here. I highly appreciate it. It's been a wonderful night. Be good to yourselves. And oh, and remember, we all agreed between now and next time, we're going to do something odd. And next week, I want to hear about what was the odd thing that you did. And we'll see if it ended up on the news or anything like that. All right. Have a great night, everybody. Be well.